Right, welcome everybody to uh, November's meeting of the uh, Boynton Peninsula Astronomical Society. Um, for those uh, that don't know me, I'm Peter, I'm the uh, current year's uh, president. Um, I would ask, uh, are there any new members here tonight who've only joined in the last uh, uh, month or two? A little bit of that. <laughs> well, 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 visitors are always welcome. Potential <laughs> members. I'm going to join. You're going to join. Excellent, excellent. Uh, unfortunately, our new members officer isn't here. She's about 700 kilometres away at the moment. But um, I'm sure one of our other uh, members will put up their hand and, uh, and, and offer to show you around, won't you, Jamie? Yeah. 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 So J J Jamie will put up his hand so you know who he is. Now, on the front uh, slide here, because uh, it's been uh, uh, in the news uh, certainly earlier this year, um, the, uh, the nice brownie coloured one on the, uh, the right there is uh, the one that the New Horizons spacecraft, which is the one that flew by Pluto originally, went on to go to the asteroid uh, 2014 MU69, which is uh, effectively a, a naming convention based on the, uh, the week of the year that um, uh, the, uh, it was originally discovered. That was then subsequently named Ultima Tulu, but uh, there, that actually caused a bit of controversy earlier in the year because it was pointed out that that's where the Nazis came from originally mm -hmm. in their beliefs. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a bit of a, a change in the name uh, occurred and uh, yesterday they announced it was now going to be called uh, Arakoff, uh, which is a North American uh, Indian name meaning sky. Right, so uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, binary body there is, uh, is now known as Arakoff. It looks like a donut in... in, in, in process of being made. It does, doesn't it? Yes. Um, and quite a lot of detail, as you can see, with the, uh, the shape fitting that they've done there. Now the other um, diamond-shaped uh, object on the right-hand side is uh, a carbon-rich uh, uh, asteroid uh, called uh, Ryugu that the Japanese uh, craft uh, Hayabusa 2, the second craft uh, to go out to the asteroids, um, earlier this year actually pelted it with a titanium pellet grabbed a uh, sample from the surface and uh, hopefully, if I click on that, we might actually see the moment of impact uh, when they fire the pellet onto the surface. If you haven't seen this one on the news uh, previously, but you see it gently comes down to the surface and then all of a sudden it, uh, it fires its titanium bullet into it and collects the rubble on the way back out, on the bounce outwards. Now that craft is now heading back to Earth and it's due to uh, land in Woomera uh, next year in December. So it's about a 13 month uh, drive, 30 months uh, flight. So initially, as it was uh, moving away from the asteroid, it used uh, ordinary chemical rocket propellants. And the idea is about a week later, it's going to um, go to uh, an onboard iron drive. So a different kind of uh, rocket thrust uh, being used to bring it back. But nevertheless, it will take uh, 13 months to uh, get here. And that will be the big thing next year to uh, look at when we may actually see uh, what the composition of uh, these bodies are. <coughs> right, so uh, tonight, uh, first of all, I'll, um, uh, I'll show you a short video that only goes for about uh, three, three minutes or so about the centenary of uh, the IAU. The IAU asked every country that has uh, an astronomical presence to produce a representative video of itself and this was uh, released only yesterday uh, by the Astronomical Society of Australia to represent Australia. So you'll actually um, see what they, they submitted as part of um, uh, that request from the IAU. The IAU is the international uh, governing body, if you like, uh, across all of the uh, uh, professional astronomical societies uh, globally. Uh, after that, I'll talk uh, as usual about what we've done in the past month here in society and what we're, uh, we're gonna be doing before the next meeting. Um, then we have uh, Dr. Bill Birch here, uh, retired from uh, Museum Victoria, who's uh, kindly uh, come uh, uh, all the way down here to, uh, to speak to us tonight uh, on uh, meteorites. Uh, he has actually spoken to the Society a couple of times that I remember in the past. Uh, although we weren't actually here in this building, uh, we were having these meetings at, down at the, uh, the Peninsula School in Mount Eliza actually at the time, so quite a while ago. Then we'll break for uh, the tea break. Uh, any of you who haven't actually uh, got an almanac for next year yet, we've still got some uh, left uh, before they go on sale to uh, the public, and then all the public nights coming up. Then after the tea break, and we'll probably break for about 15 minutes or so to give people enough uh, time. 
Uh, and during the tea break, uh, those who wish to look through um, the telescopes down the observatory, um, should, you know, hopefully we'll get a, a bit of an opportunity if the sky is clear for the representing thing out there. So straight after the break, we'll come back in here. Mark will give um, Sky for the month. Uh, then Sky Murphy will um, do her uh, what's now known as the pie in the sky uh, segment. Yeah, she sort of goes a bit uh, left field. Uh, Ian Sullivan, if he's up to it, uh, can can do trivia if he can remember what uh, what what to actually ask. <laughs> then I'll show um, three short uh, science-related uh, videos towards the end. One um, is very very interesting. It's to do with the um, potential flipping of um, Earth's magnetic field and uh, something that was found by the Russians from uh, the, uh, the Soyuz craft that uh, they originally um, uh, classified the information uh, and uh, it was kept secret for over a decade because of the implications of it. And this, uh, this way I should show you uh, all about that. Uh, then uh, I'll, uh, I'll show you one about the Newton's Cradle. For those of you who don't know what a Newton's Cradle is, it's one of these little things that goes uh, Tick, 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 tick. If you don't know how they work and why they work, this, um, this video will uh, explain all. And then lastly, and most importantly, we're going to answer the question of uh, did Rapunzel's hair actually enable the prince to climb up it in reality to uh, close for the year? Now remember there's no meeting uh, at all um, next, uh, next month. Uh, Saki usually doesn't meet uh, in December, uh, certainly not on the third uh, Wednesday. There is one in January. There is indeed one January, yeah. Okay, so in the last month, we've uh, had a few uh, schools uh, sort of uh, squeeze us in for uh, telescope nights. Uh, on the 17th, which was just after the last uh, general meeting we did, we had um, St. Simon the Apostle, which I think was a school from Roeville, came down to a school camp at Safety Beach, and we went down there, and it was absolutely pouring with rain all evening. So they got to hear me talk for an hour and a half instead of uh, going out to... Um, outside. Uh, nevertheless, they were quite uh, quite happy to have something to do in the evening. Uh, 19th, we had uh, the, uh, the members uh, barbecue and hopefully there was some maintenance done earlier on uh, in the day. I wasn't there myself, I couldn't, uh, couldn't be there. Then on the 23rd, um, the society had its uh, committee meeting and uh, the primary things that were really talked about was uh, uh, replacing one of the mounts in the telescope in the main observatory, which is now actually being done, so it's consistent um, type of um, uh, uh, mount and, uh, and uh, controller to uh, all the others down there. Uh, we confirmed that there's going to be an end of the year mail out again and this was done in the past primarily to remind people that um, their membership uh, fees for the society are due 1st of January and so that's uh, like a physical mail out as well. Um, committee also introduced a joining fee for new members coming in to help offset some, <coughs> some good uh, quality name badges for them made of uh, metal and also to um, try and discourage people from um, coming and going as members uh, all the time so um, uh, you know, they might uh, not come for six months and then, uh, then come along halfway through. Uh, and lastly, uh, the library, I don't know if you noticed, the, uh, the library behind us has had a lot of work done to it by uh, Lara Conway, who uh, I don't think is here tonight, I can't see her in the audience. Uh, she's been spending a lot of time here organising things and also going through all the past uh, astronomy magazines uh, that are shown on the shelves there, so uh, coming up with a master collection <laughs> where we have one of everything and if there's any duplicates then members or indeed members of the public uh, um, can probably have uh, the Duke of uh, for free to so encourage them to learn a bit about uh, astronomy. Um, after uh, the committee, I went up to um, a, uh, a primary school in Kensington to um, give the, uh, um, the National Science Week competition that we ran this uh, year, uh, which was, if you remember from previous, year, uh, previous months, where I presented on the number of craters on the moon, the, uh, the nationwide um, competition that we ran in July and August. The winner was actually from that school, it was a seven year old girl from that school, got closest to the right answer. And if you remember, the correct answer for the number of craters on the moon was 2.3 quintillion, um, as opposed to NASA's value of um, one quintillion, which uh, was a pretty, pretty good uh, guess from the, uh, the kids. Anyway, um, presented the, uh, the moon rock tour, which, uh, which was a moon rock tour. 
and, um, and that was in front of her entire school with 302. So uh, she was a very proud little girl and um, very, very keen on science and certainly will be now, hopefully. Uh, a couple of days later, we were down in uh, Langwarren for uh, Bayside uh, Christian College, uh, curiously on Halloween, given that they don't uh, sort of celebrate Halloween particularly in that, uh, that particular school. And they were very fortunate in that it was a completely cloud-free evening, so they had uh, not only uh, a talk, but also lots of time on the telescopes and seeing the planets up and everything uh, really, really good. First of November, we had the room here quite full. <coughs> with 120 uh, in attendance. We were, we were actually having to turn people away because um, uh, we, we couldn't really uh, safely fit them in. Um, and uh, so we made it a bit of overflow of those into December. Unfortunately, that evening was 95% uh, cloud cover, so um, they got some, <coughs> some view later in the evening, but uh, not a whole lot. A week later, we had the usual Scout Cubs and Guides night that we run four times a year here at the Brewers. And it was just one troop from uh, Karen Downs came along. And uh, they at least got to see um, most of the planets up in the sky at the time. And uh, they went away uh, quite happy and uh, uh, doing their astronomy badge. Uh, on the 13th, uh, we had Dorinia Primary next door here at the education camp. They came on over and unfortunately for them, 100% uh, cloud cover, so uh, at this time of the year they were just uh, very, very unlucky because uh, uh, often it's, it's nice and warm and clear, but unfortunately it wasn't uh, that night. Is there going to be any arrangements with that during or have they said anything they're going to come back? or? You know. um, we, we have actually visited during your actually at the school several times over the years, about eight or nine times I think over the years, but it, it depends a lot on the teachers because the teachers change over, over the years and uh, the next ones come along and they forget about you and then uh, it usually um, relies upon the next generation of teachers to learn about you and then they, uh, they ask you for an in incursion or an excursion. And so this particular one was an incursion for us. Uh, on the 17th, uh, I believe a couple of our members with Dave and Jamie went to uh, the Radio Fest at um, Rosebud and I saw it was cloudy all day so you couldn't actually yeah. use the solar telescope to, uh, to show them that, but that might. <laughs> yeah, did you get many people coming through? Uh, it was actually quite, I think. It was yeah, quite unusual, though. So yeah, it was a little bit uh, disappointing, but the weather was not good. <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so that, that's sort of like an area between um, the ham amateur radio uh, side of things and uh, the, uh, the solar side of things because of course propagation depends a lot on uh, solar activity and how it actually impacts the uh, upper ions here. Uh, and of course this month is the uh, famous Leonie's meteor shower uh, which was meant to have peaked uh, a couple of days ago. Um, I didn't actually see it this year, but uh, I don't know if anyone here uh, actually got up early uh, to attempt to see it. It's usually a midnight to dawn type effort. Uh, given that it was a gibbous moon, it was going to be fairly washed out uh, in the moonlight, so uh, not, uh, not as uh, impressive as in previous years. But it's still there if, uh, if people are keen to, uh, to sit up. Now, because we don't have a December meeting, there's a fair, fair amount on the calendar between now and the January meeting. Um, the, uh, the members' barbecue is this uh, Saturday, and I assume there's going to be maintenance uh, activities done for that at uh, four o'clock uh, as usual. Uh, committee meeting next uh, Wednesday. Our public night so far only has 73 booked, but uh, given that that is um, over a week ago, uh, weeks ago, uh, is guaranteed to fill to 100 plus um, uh, by that time. Uh, it will be fun, uh, will be filled. 14th of December is the uh, Christmas breakup for the society with the cries. Then in January, we've uh, decided to rearrange our usual um, four public nights. Instead of being the first four Fridays of the month, it's going to be the first Friday and the first Saturday. So you'll notice the 3rd of January and the 4th of January there. And the 10th and the 17th. So originally it would have been the 24th, so we've actually attempted to have the public nights a little bit earlier to try and capture people who um, get an instrument for Christmas and are looking for some sort of guidance on how to actually uh, use it. So in other words, uh, try and pull back the nights a little bit closer to uh, Christmas there. And uh, some of the others there in January after the next uh, meeting, uh, just a second heads up about that one in May, uh, which uh, was a, an expedition down to Point Leo um, that, uh, that Sky has kindly uh, uh, organised for us. So tonight's talk, we have uh, Bill Birch, Q 
curator emeritus, which means he's retired, uh, the geosciences at uh, Museum Victoria, and indeed um, uh, you have um, shown me before the Cranberry meteorite down in the bowels of uh, the Royal oh, Exhibition okay. Building yeah. many, many years ago. Yeah. And uh, going to talk on uh, a very topical uh, subject this year, particularly with the Murchison uh, meteorite uh, anniversary, on the unusual meteorites of uh, Victoria. So um, with that, uh, I invite uh, okay. you to come on up and I'll uh, try and bring up your uh, presentation. Well, um, thanks very much, Peter, for the uh, introduction, and um, uh, thanks for the invitation to be here, and also for the very nice meal I had before. It's um, good to see a full house, um, and I hope that the talk I give you will be uh, interesting. Um, it's uh, really a skate through uh, the most interesting Victorian meteorites, uh, and I'll explain why as we go through. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I, uh, I am retired. Uh, I retired about four years ago. I, I had 40 years as curator of minerals, rocks, meteorites and gemstones at the museum. So um, I've had a lot to do with meteorites, Victorian ones, through that time. I've actually described seven of them, um, but I'm not by any means a meteorite expert because I don't work with them all the time. I have to rely on um, other people who have got much more um, specialist skills who, who work with meteorites all the time. Nevertheless, now some, I'll just start with a bit of introduction, quite simple. Um, what are they? Well, you'll all know they're any extraterrestrial extra rock or mineral that reaches the Earth's surface after passing through the atmosphere. If they don't reach the Earth's surface, if they still leave a flare or a, a, you know, a, a, a lot of noise, then they're meteors. And uh, most meteorites uh, originate in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, but there are some, of course, as you know, that come from Mars and the Moon. We don't have any of those in Victoria. <coughs> Not that we know of. How many are there? Uh, well, according to the latest um, meteoritical bulletin, there are about 62,000 meteorites considered to be valid. Uh, in other words, they've been authenticated by scientists Another 7,600 or so have been named provisionally, um, but only just that many have had full descriptions published. So there's quite a few that have just been put into the literature uh, without a full description. We're not talking about micrometeorites because there are millions of micrometeorites that have fallen and, and they don't get um, they don't get classified. How are they classified? Well, it's complicated. Um, historically, there are, again, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, there are three main classes based mainly on the mineralogy and the texture. So stony, stony iron, and iron. Now, that's early. Nowadays, it's a bit more complicated. Um, so, Uh, it's really because we've got a lot more advanced chemical and dating methods uh, and that's led to increasing subdivision. You know how scientists love to subdivide things uh, and classify things. So now they're based around chondrites, primitive achondrites and, and, and achondrites. Now the term chondrites um, just refers to these little spherical, glassy or um, uh, spheres that are made of silicate minerals and these are common in many uh, many meteorites and they represent little globules of, that formed as sort of like in a, a flash heating event early in the history of the solar system. So they've been preserved right from the very start and they form, and when you can see those in the, in the meteorite then you have chondrites. Um, and the term primitive, uh, if you, I'll, I'll go back a bit here, here are the three classifications originally, stony, stony iron, iron, and now you can see how they've all been sort of divided up here. The stonies are all across here. Um, the stony irons are just down here. 
and the ions are in here and a few in here. So it's got very complicated. Uh, Australia's meteorites. Well, we have about 775 records of meteorites found so far. Um, 700 have been formally named. There'd be a lot more out there waiting to be found. We also have um, 27 impact sites uh, where very large meteorites in the past have made uh, craters of all sorts of sizes. Um, you're probably familiar with some of them. Uh, Wolf Creek, uh, Henbury, some of you may have been there, but there are quite a lot of smaller ones in WA. This is Beavis Crater, only about, say 25 metres across, and Dalgaranga. And all of these have, uh, I'm not so sure about, yeah, Beavis does have meteorites associated with it, and Dalgaranga does too, not much. And Henbury, of course, has got a lot of meteorites, iron meteorites. Has anyone been to any of those sites? Yes. Amazing to think about the history. This is the distribution of meteorites throughout Australia and you can see immediately there's this heavily concentration on the Malabar, the Malabar Plains. This is uh, probably one of the biggest meteorites there. Um, this is uh, Mundrabilla, a piece of the Mundrabilla meteorite, very large iron meteorite. But you can see they're all over the place. Um, and probably if you knew where they, where all the meteorites had fell, you'd, there'd be no green on this tiger and they'd all be yellow dots joined up. You can think about the impact history on Earth. What about Victoria though? Well, we only have 17 known meteorites or named ones, and here they are. Uh, and you can see there's a concentration um, in the west uh, of the state, and there's a reason for that. Um, because, well, as you probably realise, in the eastern part of the state, uh, it's all forest, timber, timber country, and you just don't see them. It's also wetter, so there's probably a lot of them weathered away. And you'll notice that all of the meteorites have fallen close to little, uh, little country towns in, uh, in uh, the western part of Victoria, so that's very convenient for, um, for going and getting them. Uh, that's only that's purely coincidence. It's all there be meteorites all through here. And this is the, a diagram just to show the Victoria, where the Victorian meteorites fit on that classification system I showed you before. So we have two carbonaceous chondrites, Murchison and Rainbow, and I'll show you a little bit about those two. We have um, we have six ordinary ordinary uh, what we call ordinary chondrites, chondri uh, chondrites yes, uh, Jimbula, Meribara, Piggit, Culnine, Tara, Yalabar, and there's this one over on Bay, which was found on the Wilson's on Wilson's promontory um, some years ago. That's not in our collection, that's in South Australia. Then of the irons, we have Ballarat, Cranburn and Wedderburn. Uh, we have, um, sorry, the primitive achondrites. Then of the achondrites, we have Pendock, which no longer exists, Yarraway, Lismore, and this Willow Grove, which I'll talk about as well, is ungrouped, it doesn't fit into any group. It's extremely rare. So that just shows you the spread of Victorian meteorites amongst the classification scheme. It's quite, it's quite a good mix. So in other words, we do hunch about our weight in some ways. Are they all left where they fall? Yes. Well, until we come along and pick them up. Yes, that's right. <laughs> now, we we'll start off with Cranburn because um, you're all probably familiar with this as well. But there are at least 13 uh, masses known. There are probably more. They were spread over a distance of about 24 kilometres and they, had, they got various names depending on where they were found. Um, they were first recorded by Europeans in 1853-54. And they were known to indigenous people. There were stories of, of uh, Aboriginal people using the, the metal, uh, hitting it with stones to make a, a ringing sort of noise. Um, they range in weight from 3.5 tonnes to down to 7 kilograms. At the time it was the largest um, iron meteorite in Australia and it still ranks very highly. Uh, the Cranbourne uh, number one, the biggest, is in the Natural History Museum in London. And they also had Cranbourne number two, which was the second biggest. Uh, as happened in those days, in the 1860s, 1860s, everything went back to, to England. 
that anything found that was unusual. But there was almighty stink in Victoria over it, and um, including from the government. And number two was um, was sent back to us. First example of repatriation, I guess you'd say. Now this is just a map to show you the uh, the total spread uh, from Pakenham all the way down to Lang Warren, and these are the, the places where. Um, the various pieces of cranberry were found. So you can see it's quite a long strewn path. It would have made an incredible noise and um, <coughs> an impact when it when it hit. Uh, it wouldn't have made it crater, I don't think. None of these pieces would have made it well, it might have made a depression. Uh, and we're not sure how old um, or when it actually landed, but it hasn't been hasn't been dated. This is a uh, a photograph taken by Richard Daintree of uh, the uh, Cranbourne number one, the biggest one, uh, that was excavated in February and it's two uh, chains and horses. Uh, this is Cranbourne number two, which is on display in the museum. And in um, 2008, uh, a, another piece of Cranbourne was, um, I think it was ploughed up in a market garden. Uh, and um, so we went down and, and picked it up. Uh, and for the museum, and it's now on it weighs 83 kilograms, so it's quite heavy, and um, it's now on display, I think, on Burmese sort of loans and the Cranbourne. The, um, the thing about the Cranbourne meteorite is it, it flakes. It's, a, it's an iron meteorite with low nickel content, so it tends to flake away, uh, and it's very hard to keep uh, in collections without it being um, sort of, you know, bits of iron oxide and rust falling off it. So we don't particularly like Cranbourne for that matter, but it still is raised very highly as a as a, uh, a famous Victorian meteorite. Or meteorites, I should say. Now we touch briefly on Murchison, as you all probably know. Um, it's the 50th anniversary of Murchison falling uh, uh, in, uh, on that date, on Sunday, the 29th of September, 1969. At a very incre incredible time, because it was just the height of um, uh, the, the lunar landings. Everyone was interested in meteorites and, pl and space and planet planetary geology and all of a sudden this meteorite falls out of the sky uh, and it seemed to fall so in other words uh, it wasn't a find it was a fall uh, and um, created a, an incredible you know, international interest uh, <laughs> yeah, inc incredible international attention because it was very quickly realized it was a very rare type of meteorite as soon as you pick it up you smell it it's full of organic material uh, and it's had implications for um, the origin of, of life on Earth, perhaps. There were hundreds of fragments. Um, the total estimated fall was about 150 kilograms. The biggest was only seven. Um, uh, it's probably the most studied meteorite of any, which is quite amazing for Victoria meteorite. It contains hundreds of different organic compounds um, and you know, claim to represent the precursors of life on Earth. It also contains pre-solar grains, in other words, grains, microdiamonds, and other minerals that are older than our solar system. And the, 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 the dating methods on these that push the uh, the um, Murchison back to between six and a half and seven billion years. As you, as you probably know, the solar system formed around 4.65 billion. So with Murchison has pushed it back another. Um, uh, the, the, the age of Earth has been pushed back another six point, another one and a half to, to two billion, year, billion years. So a little bit about the history of, of Murchison. Uh, this is an artist's impression that was actually done in, um, in Bayswater <coughs> of the Murchison meteorite uh, falling um, at that date. 1045. There's a bit of discussion locally in Murchison about when it actually did fall, whether it was coming out of church, going into church, or whatever, uh, and whether they were having a cup of tea or finishing breakfast before they went to church. It's hard. But it's, it says 1045 here, so it's probably pretty right that no one, no one in Murchison can settle exactly on the time, which is fair enough because it's probably over. A few minutes. Uh, this is the first record. It was a. It's from the um, superintendent of one of the districts of Victoria Police uh, in um, uh, Shepherd. Yeah. 
and uh, he had reports of this coat like material falling out of the sky, particularly um, on Mr. Brisbane's dairy farm. And uh, so that was the initial official report of the Meru, the Burgess and Beaver up falling. So they're quite historical documents. Now on that, uh, the following day, um, when it was realised what it, what it was and what an incredible phenomenon it was, uh, I was at university in third year, um, third year or second year? Third year, it was, yeah. And uh, a whole lot of my classmates um, somehow got in touch with these and they all, ran, they all drove up to Murchison and they spread out and went to collect as much of Murchison as they could and they took it back to the university the geology department and went into the geology department. This bits went into the geology department's collection. And the stories got around that I was too busy studying in the library to go up and, and, and hunt for meteorites. Uh, it wasn't true, but anyway, it's a good story. And um, ironically, of course, when back in about 1989, the Melbourne University geology collections came to the museum. And I acquired, or got to look after, all the meteorites collected by my class, my classmates at the time without having to do any efforts. <coughs> uh, these are some, some of the uh, photos of some of the damage that we've done to uh, Mr. Uh, Brisbane's uh, dairy farm. <laughs> Here's uh, just a couple of holes in the, in the roof. Down and this, this little patch here is where a meteorite hit uh, an iron railing in his yard and bounced off into a pile of cow manure. Now one of my colleagues because it was coming out from the where they were milking. And one of my colleagues jokes that he had to be the one who was very, who was, you know, going through the cow manure to collect bits of the Mertz um, meteorite. Because it would have been contaminated by all sorts of other organic compounds by then. And this is a map done just to show the what's called the strewn field, where the bits of, of Murchison were, were found. These, these were plotted on a map, I think, by the students at the time. And it came in a sort of a, uh, a southeast to northwest direction, um, almost you know, over the town as well. And here's some examples of them. Uh, it's very characteristic. Here's the this piece here is intact. It's, it's got a fusion crust on it, and that's formed when it, it heats up as it comes through the atmosphere. The outer the friction causes the very outer part to melt, and then solidifies a sort of glassy film. Uh, when you break it open, it's got these little white patches. Uh, some of them are chondrules, others are what's called uh, calcium aluminium inclusions, and these are some of the, 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 the uh, that's some of the material that is pre-solar. And this is just an example of one of the uh, the uh, <coughs> specimens collected by Mr. Tony Mason, a partridge student, uh, and that was the way it was put into the university collections. I should mention also that it has a, they have a very strong kerosene organic smell. Even after 50 years, you can open a vial where we, we keep them in plastic glass, you can open it, and this strong odour comes out after all this time. And I think there have been, no one's actually been able to pinpoint what the compounds are in the, in the, in the, the vapour or the, the gas that comes off, uh, except um, in the celebrations that happened at Murchison um, a few months ago, uh, there'd been a, 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 a one piece that had been sealed completely at the time and so nothing had escaped. And the curator of the um, uh, Chicago Field Museum, uh, he was very interested in this and he's actually borrowed that specimen and they're going to somehow release the gas and detect what's actually in the gas. He was the guest, he was the guest um, I feel like Pete's name was, he was the guest sort of uh, identity of these celebrations. Um, this is just a photo, these are little micro diamonds. I'm not quite sure what the dimensions are here, but they're, they're, yeah, they're, nano, they're nano scale. Um, you can separate them out of Murchison, but these are the ones that have been dated. Uh, this is just sort of a schematic about where they've come from. They've come out of uh, carbon um, and nitrogen suns uh, that obviously predate. Um, the solar system. So Murchison's had an incredible history. Do we know why? Why? Why it's what? Why it's got this incredible history? Why? Well, because it, it comes to, it has it has things in it that come 
or before our solar system. Yeah. I was thinking of the town, not the oh. creature. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, Merchant has had a very interesting oh. too. Now, Ballarat, this is from going, to, this is a, a, our, our smallest meteorite. Uh, it's a fossil meteorite, and I'll go into why. It, it was transported and buried in a, what's called a paleo place, in other words, another, another deposit after it fell. It was discovered in a deep lead gold mine in Ballarat in the late 1860s, and somehow found its way into a personal collection of that guy, then into the University of um, Melbourne collections. It only weighs about 15 grams. And there's a, a piece that's been broken from a much larger iron meteorite. Mainly consists of a mineral called camosite, which is one of the two main minerals in iron meteorites. It's got a nickel content of 6.2. All iron meteorites have nickel contents, and that's the characteristic feature when you we're trying to determine whether a piece of a lump of iron found in a bush is a meteorite or not. You detect try and detect nickel. <coughs> um, what happened? Well, this is the area where um, this is a bit of a geology map of where the park counties, park companies' leases were. And if you look at the geology, these are the deep leaves or the, under, the buried streams under basalt. And then under the basalt, there were two gravel patches. And that was mapped in the early days uh, when Ballarat was obviously a thriving gold uh, producing area. This is what the, the, um, the meteorite looks like when it's polished. It's just most of it is just this iron, um, iron nickel alloy, the 6% nickel, and these little crystals are iron phosphide, so iron and phosphorus, and these are also very common in iron meteorites. So what happened was the meteorite fell on this landscape, we don't know when, uh, probably about 3 million years ago, uh, it broke up into bits, the bits got buried in this gravel from a, um, a, a, strip, a, a river or a stream, um, a bit further, a bit longer after that, um, we had a, a, a <coughs> river valley cut into it, and these bits here are left high and dry. See? Then we had a basalt flow. A lava flow came in and buried everything, and that's where the meteorite pieces ended up. And that's when they tunneled through under the basalt, because that's what happened at Ballarat. That's where the gold was in these deep leaves. And they found, I don't know how they only found the one piece, but there were probably more. So you, you think about the history of not only that falling, but it also being going through all this being preserved and then being found. That to me is always the amazing part. Did they recognise it as a meteorite? At the time? I think they did at the time. Yeah, it was labelled meteoritic iron uh, on the old label, so they must have done a bit of <coughs> testing. Now Maryborough, um, Maryborough has, has been in the news about uh, a few months ago because it um, uh, was found. Early in 2015, uh, it's, a, it's an ordinary meteorite. It's a common meteorite, H5, uh, and it's the third one in Victoria and the second largest one. And we think it probably fell less than a thousand years ago. I won't go into the reason why. But, uh, this is roughly where it was found in the bush, about two kilometres south of Maryborough. Uh, this is the guy who found it. He very kindly brought it to us, and uh, we uh, negotiated a deal to buy it. It's quite big. Uh, it's the biggest sort of meteorite I've found, in, uh, I'd ever seen intact. And when he was bought it, when he bought it in to show us, and I picked it up, I, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't resist letting out a, a bit of a swear word because it was so, so amazing. Uh, when you cut it, we cut the end off it. Here's the big saw cutting the end off it. Uh, here's the slab. This is what the slab looks like, and you can see it's full of little metallic grains. These are iron nickel compounds, and the rest, the browny stuff, is silicate minerals that you find on Earth, olivine. Pirates and that sort of thing. So it's a combination that tells you straight away it's a meteorite. So it's quite a common one, a quite a common type. In fact, I think 40% of all meteorites are these H5s. The terminology I won't go into, but uh, H just means high in iron. A feature of it is these. Um, I, I showed you early on pictures of chondrules. Uh, this just shows um, in thin section what some of them look like. Uh, they consist, this one consists of olivine, which is a common mineral in Victoria, in well, basalts on Earth, and this is about a millimetre across. Uh, here's a smaller one, that's about 0.4. This is consists of another, um, another type of mineral pyroxene, but they're characteristic of, of uh, chondrite meteorites. 
Now, another, moving on to another, um, this is an unusual meteorite. Uh, two pieces uh, were found, weighing that 1.1 and 1.4, found in a paddock about 12 kilometres west of Rainbow by a farmer. Um, they contain uh, abundant chondrules, probably the most chondrule rich um, meteorites that were found in the uh, A lot of it's, it's been, they've been sitting in the, that hot climate, up around uh, in, the, in the Mallee or Wimmera area. For a long while, they just look like weathered rocks. Um, you might worry about that. They've had a lot of um, uh, analyses done on them for oxygen isotopes and thermoluminescence. Uh, when I asked for um, some help with this one, the, the American uh, meteorite researchers got very excited about it because it turned out to be um, a, carbonaceous, a carbonaceous chondrite like Murchison, but a different type. And there's only 20 to 25 examples known around the world. This is Darrell Wedding. He was the piece. He's holding a piece of the rainbow meteorite there. Um, uh, he was the one who brought it to our attention. And this is the paddock in which he found it, or found it. And you can see this little map here. Here's rainbow. This is about 12 kilometres. You can see there's little dots. That's just roughly where the rainbow, two biggest pieces, one and two are rainbow. And the rest is another meteorite, which I'll just briefly mention. So you can see here you've got two different types of meteorites fallen almost into one spot. So that's that's going to be typical of the whole of that western part of Victoria. It's just a matter of finding them. This is what they look like. The, large, the largest piece is just over a kilogram and it weighs it's 13 centimetres. And this is the smaller piece. This one's since been cut to provide samples for research. If you look at the surface though, this is a cut surface, you can see all the chondrules full of them. Uh, and that's when you, you cut a thin section of the rock and you look at it, that's the, that's the texture you see. Sorry. How, yes. How did someone who's in a huge paddock spot two rocks that were different? You cloud them up. Yeah, but how did he notice that they were different? Well, because uh, in that area, in that area, there's no surface rocks. It's all sand. So if your cloud hits something uh, and you're curious about it, you'll get out and pick it up. And I suspect there's a lot of those in back sheds or stacked against fence posts all through that, that all through that area. Just a miracle that someone noticed. Yes, that was... yes, it is. It's a miracle. It fell to begin with, and then someone found it. And then I was, and I, I was thinking it's a miracle that I actually came along to hold it and look at that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, they, uh, they brought it into the museum to be identified and checked. Uh, I think that happened, and then we, we took it further. Uh, this is just a, a, a schematic diagram. I won't go into details, but it's an oxygen, oxygen isotope plot um, for the CO3 carbonaceous chondrites known um, throughout the world. And the, the green ones are from the Antarctic, the black ones are from the Sahara. And the falls, um, that just means they've been seen before, I'm not quite sure where. But here's rainbow um, stuck up at the, end, at the end of this chemical trend. So it just goes to show it's, um, it's a very unusual uh, meteorite. And it's, it's been well publicised, we've had a few scientific papers out of it. The pigic is the meteorite that the little bits that were found with it. Um, the, the only way um, from 170 grams down to 8. And it's not a particularly excitable, it's not a particularly excited, excited, exciting, it's an H5, the same as Merivara. But one thing it does show, well there's a few of them, this is the map again, it does show what's called shock. In other words, it's been, it's been hammered at some stage, and if you look at a thin section, you can see these, see these fractures, these lines running roughly through, the, through there. It's just an indication that there's been some shock effect on it. Not quite sure what that would be, but that's yeah. what distinguishes Piggy. It's, no, it's the only one in Victoria that shows those features. Now, Willow Grove, uh, this is an amazing meteorite too. Um, two pieces were found by a farmer on his property in the Latrobe Valley, uh, one in 1995 and the other in the biggest one in 1998. Bits don't fit together, so there's presumably more of them. He hasn't found them. Uh, again, you hit it with his plough. It's bright metal under a thin crust. Um, it contains 28% nickel. So it's, made, it's one of the richest um, known meteorites for nickel content. The rest, 72% is, is iron, of course. Well, yeah, most of the time. 
and there's only about four or five that have got more than that. I think one gets into 30, one of them gets into 30s. It consists of lathe martensite. Now, <coughs> I won't go into technical detail here, but martensite is that meteorites, high meteorites and steel makers swap technology, swap terminology around. So there's a lot of um, a lot of um, steel terms, steel technical terms or stru uh, structure terms get into meteorites as well. Um, so I won't go into why martensite form, but it's a characteristic sort of feature of the texture. Um, and willow grove is unique. As I said, it doesn't belong to any, it, it sits out by itself, it doesn't belong to any other group of iron meteorites. This is um, the smaller bit. <coughs> Everyone, everyone who collects a meteorite on a farm has a go at it with an angle grinder <laughs> or a tungsten pit. <laughs> One or the other. They might even dip it in acid. But it's a standard technique rather than just take it to a museum and have it tested for people. And that's what a polished surface that it looks like. Surprisingly, it's not particularly stable. It does tend to, even though it's got high nickel content, it does tend to uh, rush a bit. This is where it was found, sort of um, a general farming country. Uh, I don't think it was exactly on there, but it was in that area. And uh, just a little map showing you know, willow groves down there. And that's that sort of sound. Not, not far from the Latrobe River. Uh, we kept the small bit, and the, uh, the farmer held on to the big piece, which was fine. Uh, this just shows a couple of. Uh, this is when you polish the, um, the surface, and you can see all these cracks. But these cracks have an origin, which I won't go into. But if you actually etch the surface with a bit of acid, all these structures come out. And this is what's called the lay martensite structure. You see all these different patterns. And that is very unusual. Now we come to Wedderburn, which is maybe my, my favourite meteorite at the moment, actually, because um, <coughs> we're doing the work, I've been doing a bit of work on it. It was found in um, 1950. Uh, it's the size of a lemon. It was found. Um, about three three miles northeast of Wedderburn uh, on a track, and the guy who was finding it, he found that he was a prospector. He kicked at it, and he thought it was heavy, so he picked it up and he took it down to the Geological Survey in Melbourne, and um, they sent it off to be tested. And sure enough, very quickly, it was found to be a meteorite. Uh, that's it originally weighed 210 grams, and that was its dimensions, five five centimeters by by that. Uh, and uh, uh, scientists and CSIRO uh, Austin Edwards described it. And since then, because it was uh, unusual, um, <coughs> slices were distributed mainly in the 60s to leading research institutions, including Max Planck Institute in Germany, Cambridge Uni, and a couple of um, meteorite um, departments or institutes in the US and California. And it's now regarded as a very rare type of iron meteorite, one of only 10 belonging to this group here. Um, it's a subgroup, S means subgroup, and low means low in gold, and H means high in nickel. Now, again, I would have shown you that, where that fitted on that early classification diagram, but I won't go back to it now. Uh, but the whole group of that is called the, the, uh, the IAB complex, this iron AB complex. And this terminology has come out of a whole different sequence of classification um, um, models, if you like. And the interesting thing about, Merges, about Wedderburn is it was when it, when it was being stu studied at Cambridge University in the early 70s, 1970s, uh, the guy who was working on it, his name's Ed Scott, um, he, he found that the meteorite contained iron carbides. Uh, that's Fe, C, iron in different combinations. Couldn't work out what their composition. Well, he did work out a few of their compositions because in those days it was pretty interesting. <coughs> um, but just this year, um, a new species uh, of iron carbide in Wedderburn was um, was finally described and it was named after him, Ed Scott. And I'll show you a bit about it. Uh, this is just a map of Wedderburn, and we think the. Um, <coughs> The meteorite was found somewhere up here. Uh, the guy who found it, Charles Bell, Charles Bell, yeah, uh, he's long past, um, but he was a local prospector who covered a whole lot of church. You can think that's probably where it was. This is what it looks like um, now. It's just that sort of shape, um, and you can 
see it's got a little bit of rust around the outside and bright metal inside. Only five centimetres across. Um, this is what it looks like. Now this is, um, I, can, I, can, I think I can describe this for you. This here, this main mineral here, or this pale grey uh, host if you like, is um, the mineral teenite, which is the iron, which is a nickel rich part, the nickel rich mineral in iron meteorites. Um, this grain in here is an iron phosphide called triversite, and around it you can see this rim, and that's the nickel pore alloy called uh, camisite. Uh, now, see the red arrow? Um, there's a little wave, a little thing sliver in there, and there are more, a few more of them around here. That's your Ed Scottite. That's your iron carbide, the new mineral. This shows a magnified um, view, not exactly that there, I don't think. But here's your uh, phosphide in here. Here's your camisite around the end, the edge. Here's your um, nickel rich bit, and then here is the Ed Scottite. And this is only two microns, so you can see. These are only two microns wide. So it takes a lot to actually fully characterise that mineral. And that's what's been done. I was trying to monitor where all the bits had gone to for study. And one of them had gone to Cambridge uh, from the Geological Survey in 1971 uh, for Ed Scott to look at for his PhD with the request that it come back to be returned. Well, as you can imagine, it never was. Um, however, when I made inquiries whether they still had it or not, just earlier this year, because I was interested in investigating um, whether they were like because of the Ed Scottite connection, uh, I asked them if they still had it. And they said yes, they did. And then they realised it was actually on a loan. So they agreed, or well, offered to send it back. Of course, I was delighted to have that happen. Uh, even though it wasn't to the geological muse geological survey, it was at the museum. Um, so they, that, that didn't worry them. So here's a little piece that um, Ed Scott would have, it's a little slice that Ed Scott would have uh, used to first detect carbides in here. He probably drilled that little hole in it. It's actually polished, it doesn't show you well, but there's a nice polished surface. So that's come back after nearly 50 years. We'll lost chopped up into lots of bits. It had, we've lost, we've lost, um, yeah, it, 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 was it was 210 to start with. Ed was the original describer uh, and uh, some early analysis took it down to about 160. And then the other bits that have been sent off have brought it down to 74. <laughs> so that's, it's less than half what it was. Um, this just shows you where, uh, you know, I mentioned the um, different classifications of the, the uh, IAB group. Uh, and that's um, the main group is in here. Wedderburn sits, this is Wedderburn here. So it sits in, it's actually grouped with these um, grey ones, which are the um, SLH. So the, the, the most important elements when you're looking at iron meteorites are the composition of iron, nickel, gold, germanium, gallium, and iridium. Now, of course, in the old days, they couldn't analyse those without, with, well, they could, because it was rather difficult. So, now they're using these these ratios, these gold gold up here, iridium up here, to separate the meteorite compositions out. It seems to work quite well. Until someone comes along and upturns it all. Okay, well that's about it. I um I haven't got to cover these, so talk about these. I suppose you know does anyone know what these are? No? Australites, have you heard of Australites or tectites? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Victoria, Victoria is famous for its tectites. They're not meteorites. <coughs> They're glassy, black glassy buttons, uh, different shapes, uh, aerodynamically shaped. Uh, but they formed a res as a result of a, of a meteorite impact of at least one, maybe more, in Southeast Asia about 800,000 years ago. Um, and the, uh, <coughs> the resulting fragments were sent up into the atmosphere or through the atmosphere came back down and melted as they came back down and all these different forms um, resulted. And Victoria has the best of them, of any of them, anywhere. This sort of phenomenon occurs around in various countries around the world, but the Australian Spoonfield is very big 
But the Victorian domestics with these these little flange buttons are actually concentrated on the Port Campbell coast. Mm. You can go and collect. These are 800,000 years old. We know that because we've been able to date the glass. And we think we've, they think they've found a crater in Southeast Asia, it's in Cambodia, um, with it's a lake now. So this is another another story of the Victorian impact, well, impact story, if you like, which is um, quite amazing. But I don't know where I'm touching Why do they not qualify as meteorites? They're not meteorites. Oh, they come from what they've come from. What's the qualification of a meteorite? Well, it has to be an extraterrestrial rock. These are bits of Earth rock. So these are bits of the Mars and back. No, no. These are landed and splashed. A meteorite has landed, Southeast Asia, a big one. Yeah. It's melted the surrounding rocks into yeah. little bits. The surrounding rocks, those little bits, have gone, been blasted up into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. through the atmosphere. Uh, how they got the escape velocity, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. They've fallen back down. All over the place, but generally in a sort of south southeastern direction across Australia. And as they come down through the atmosphere, they're spinning mm -hmm. or twisting, mm -hmm. and they get aerodynamic because they're molten, they get shaped. Mm -hmm. and once they hit the ground, they well, sometimes they'll break, but sometimes they'll be the, even the flange is, um, a little, is, is preserved. They look as if they're molten, they've been molten. Yes, they have been molten. But yeah. they're not. But they're not meteorites. They're because they're earth, they're bits of earth rock. That's the difference. What's the chemical composition of these? They're um, a, a, a silicate glass. Um, I have to. I have to. Yeah. Yes, probably about seventy percent silica. Yeah. The rest iron, potassium, sodium. They're just yeah. earth rocks yeah. turned into glass. So how do they associate it with the uh, the crater in Southeast uh, Asia? Is it just purely based on the date? Because looking at uh, that, you can't tell from the scatter pattern the direction of the No, you can't. No, you can't. In fact, um, again, it would be the same. You'd have phosphorites all through the east as well. There's one there's one being found on, on Phillip Island a few years ago. That's, I think, even though it shows them up here, um, I'm not quite sure about that, but uh, I know there's one on Phillip Island. So th they would have fallen. They would have fallen. <coughs> but that's, you know, too hard to find. But you can walk along the cliff tops here. Um, and that's, we've got a fantastic collection, not that we've done it all, but the scientists have collected most of those. So what are they called again? Sorry? What are they called again? Uh, tech, well, the, the, the general term is tectites, uh, T-E-K-T-I-T-E, uh, but we call these the Australian ones, the Australites. I think there's a couple of glass packages up the front. Yeah. Like so, in summary, the Victoria has a few meteorites, but some of them are amongst the rest of the known. Certainly, a bunch of them are late. Uh, ones at the front would be Murchison, Rainbow, Willow Grove, and Wedderburn. But there are, there are more of them out there still to be found. So, I encourage you all to uh, keep your eyes open whenever you're out in the bush. <laughs> so, thanks for that. If you've got questions, I'll try and answer them. Um, you said earlier that uh, you bought them from the people that found them. Yes. How much are they worth? Uh, well, it depends on um, on how rare they are. Uh, a piece of Murchison might be worth uh, a thousand times a piece of Meribar. Because Meribar is very common type, uh, and there's lots of them. Whereas Meribar, whereas uh, Murchison is. Um, much rarer, yeah. and uh, I, you couldn't put a price on uh, those other ones there. I, I, I wouldn't know how to price them, because they're, they're one, of, one of a kind. Yeah, yeah, so but yeah there, is a commercial, there is a commercial value for people, right? There's quite a lot of people collecting. Maybe one of the meteorites come from one place to survive. What I'd like to know is, what's the damage rate uh, destroying people's property over the years in Australia? Has it got a high rate, a medium rate, or a low rate? What are the chances, you mean? Yeah, you know, the damage Oh, rate. no, there's hardly, well, I mean, you saw the damage done to Mr. Brisbane's cow shed roof. Um, I don't know of any other damage uh, caused by a meteorite falling in Australia at all. There's only been one or two examples of anyone being hit by a meteorite. Um, I think a woman in the US was hit on the thigh by a meteorite falling down. Uh, and of course, meteorites like Chelyabinsk, the one that fell a few years ago in, in Russia, that caused a lot of damage because of the, uh, the money from the shockwave.
the meteorites themselves were little bits, it was the shockwave that did it. Yep. Surely with all these people walking around with metal detectors, it'd be more far more, was it but basically iron? Yes. I, I agree with you, but I suspect if you're, if you're uh, out in the bush looking for gold, <coughs> and your metal detector Where goes up and you dig up a piece of iron, what do you do? Oh, Throw it away. <laughs> you say, no, it's still up a line, I want, I want gold. So I suspect that round Wedderburn, there'd be a few more bits of Wedderburn, I suspect. Yep? Can I just ask, uh, the obligate, if you find a meteorite, yes. what are the obligations around that? Do you naturally get to keep it or do you have to? Um, there's no obligations at all. Mm -hmm. uh, some, uh, that's not quite true. In Victoria, there's none. In some states, there are. There's state legislation governing meteorites. Um, there's export controls on known meteorites as well. If you want to export one, you have to get a permit. But in Victoria, you can you can fossick, find a meteorite and basically do what you like with it. But it's no use to you until you know it's a meteorite uh, and you know that it's what type it is. So you really have to give it to somebody who can who can tell you that. <coughs> but there's no no obligation. No. So if you went to Crater Sorry? If you, if you went to Crater and you found a meteorite, are you allowed to keep it? You, you can keep it if you yeah. want to, yeah. But unless unless it's been named unless it's been named and gone through the meteoritic society and officially classified, then it's just a lump of <laughs> yep. Oh, who has the question? Yeah. Um, my metallurgical studies way, way back. Yeah. Uh, Martin site and a few other things cropped up. Yep. Uh, structures and related to uh, cooling rates. Cooling rates, yeah. Is that the same here? Yep. All these meteorites cool at different. They've all formed, they've come out of um, the, the iron mines in particular, come out of bits of, of planet, uh, of little planets that have got enough, to, they're differentiated enough to have a core, a bit like the Earth. Uh, but they've all cooled at different rates. Uh, they've been broken apart, obviously. They've all had different issues. So the texture you get, um, the structure you get, will give you some idea of the cooling rates. Yeah. But that, as you said, it gets back to what I said about the interplay between metallurgy and media. Yeah. yeah. Is the attitude towards um, the, the capture and the care of meteorites the same all over the world? Or are they created for well, a bit more precious in other countries? And is there a website or a World Bank where you can actually find out about meteorites around the world? If you, if you Google Meteoritical Society, you'll get all the information you want. You'll get um, all the uh, all the meteorites um, that have been classified there on there. give you all the details you like. Um, whether any country values meteorites more than others, it, it really gets back to um, the, uh, the institutions and the and the critical mass of researchers in that country, I think, make it whether it's important or not. Yeah. I understand that the houses, particularly, have got a lot of micro or can have micro meteorites in the gases and yes. here. How can you tell that the little speck you're looking at is a micro meteorite? <laughs> I don't really know because I've never looked at. It. I've never seen one. <laughs> um, uh, again, it probably has it probably has a certain composition. I think a lot of micrometeorites are iron, are iron oxide. Um, so if some have been affected as they come through the atmosphere, they've been oxidised. I don't know. I'm not sure. But of course, millions of these form in the, fall in the oceans. There are meteorites falling in the oceans as well. So it's not a topic I'm really uh, in favour with, I'm afraid. You need to clean your gutters anyway. Clean your gutters out. I suppose the $64 million pressure you like when we get a dam for it. What actually regulates it is that we get the odd meteorite coming to the atmosphere and yeah. smashing into the ground. What's the cause of it? Because I think I asked you, Bertrand, a long time ago, what controls this summit unknown suddenly comes crashing to the earth? What's the cause of that ir irregularity? You know? Well, I, I, think after, I think it is a mostly random. I think what, what is the earth is mostly random. <coughs> Um, but there are, uh, and I, have, I didn't go into it, but there are um, certain areas of, of the Earth, uh, certain parts of the Earth, that are more prone or more likely to have a meteorite impact because of the way that the, um, the Earth moves around the sun and its own rotation. But I, I, I can't explain it. But there are pref there's a slight preference for where a meteorite will hit 
on the Earth's surface. Obviously, the poles may be able to skim like a big tundra screw event, but um, yeah, so it's, it's mainly random, but I suspect there is a little bit of influence of, about the Earth from the Earth itself. Yes, sir. Yeah, even though the rainbow one is different to Murchison, yeah. uh, if you extend the Murchison path, would it pass through rainbow territory? In what, in what way? Uh, if, if you extend the path, the flight path of the Murchison one, would that... Oh, uh, no, I oh, see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you looked at the... Um, yeah, I, 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 I haven't tried that, but it's an entirely different type of meteorite. Mm -hmm. um, you, you very rarely would get a meteorite falling and would have different different types within that meteorite, you know what I mean? So I think it's just... Yeah. Any other questions? Gee, Blake. Uh, 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 yeah, in a moment. Uh, I was going to ask, um, are the other states uh, similar to us in the sense that they have a, a nice mixture of different types of meteorites? Uh, Yes, well, Western Australia would have the most, of course. Uh, Victoria would have the, le the, the least amount of meteorites. Oh, no, Tassie would have fewer. I'm not quite sure how many meteorites are, but you can get that information off the, um, the meteorite boards on that website. <coughs> to you. It'll tell you how many um, uh, recorded meteorites there are in the state. But, but you might actually get that just from the surface area of uh, the, the actual uh, states, you know, Tassie being uh, the small state. Yeah, you could, but then you have to take um, the likelihood of discovery. As well, which is whether you've got sandy desert or whether you've got thick forests. And you won't find them generally in thick forests. So, if one of our members is out in the bush here uh, at Mount Martha and comes across a rock, what should they do? <laughs> well, not any rock. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you, you try, you don't have to put a, you don't have to get an oxy welding or whatever, or a, um, angle grind. an angle grinder or whatever. You, maybe just a file. Uh, to see if it's got bright metal underneath it. If it's heavy, uh, it looks out of place, then by all means bring it into the museum. Test it. You know when you see the big craters at Wolf Creek for that? Yeah. What happens to the meat? Does it go sailing onto the ground? Uh, the, well, the craters it, are often formed by the, the meteorite completely explodes above the surface uh -huh. and, and blasts itself to bits. And over time, those bits will um, just weather away. Yeah, so. Right. Yeah. Um, oh. I was hoping that when we go fossicking for dinosaurs in May, with the geologist, maybe you will come across some meteorites. <laughs> <laughs> the one that killed them, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, Dan, I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll stop for you. Can we say thanks to him? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a nice video on for me, have you anyway? This 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 wine is not um, not of a prestigious brand or anything like that. But it came through my hands and I drink this wine mm -hmm. and I reckon it's good, you see. So good. my judgment is impeccable. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, let's break for a tea break now. We'll reconvene in here at uh, 20 to 10. I've been looking up at our sky and our stars, interpreting what they've seen. Right, so I lift the 18. I've lift the 18 by, but I've only got a full here. And give meaning to their lives. Today, we are still seeking answers from the sky and celebrating the light that has fallen on our planet for the first 100 years of the International Astronomical Union. In Australia, the history of astronomy is, in part, the story of iconic places, projects, and technology. <coughs> Some of these historic places still produce important science and will continue to do so in the future. But more than the places and the equipment, Australian astronomy is the story of the men and women who had the vision and dedication to design, build, operate 
an improved so this, this video is uh, the entry from Australia to the IAU representing who saw the value uh, in combining the strength of optical and radio astronomy and made Australia, Australia and, uh, a pioneer in observing and, and measuring first our sun and then other stars. As we moved into the technological <coughs> age and then the age of information, the facilities became more sophisticated and the science more complex. Australians have long produced world-class science, creating multidisciplinary facilities that capture ever more intricate data from our galaxy and those beyond it, finding innovative applications for technologies from optical fibers to spectrographs. Our ideas Technology and people are at work around the world, furthering the science and aims of astronomy. At the forefront of every innovation and discovery in astronomy, Australia is well represented by people of incredible talent, creativity and perseverance. Today, we're breaking new ground in international <laughs> astronomy with the development of CSIRO's Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory and the construction of the Square Kilometre Array in Australia and South Africa. The development of powerful simulations and associated theoretical work is providing exciting new insights. Today, we're not just looking at the stars, we're looking at the planets that surround them, and we're looking back in time to the very beginnings of the universe. What do you say to let everybody else in this Oh, okay. Thanks very much, mate. As we celebrate the centenary of the IAU, we celebrate the people, professionals and amateur, that are taking our vision to the farthest reaches of the universe. We respect and admire our Earth's first astronomers, our Indigenous Australians, and we look forward to the next 100 years under one sky. <laughs> and, and there's no just a, a member Alex Journey got a, a credit on that one through uh, some of his uh, videography that uh, was shown on there. Okay, so I'll throw it For one. over 60,000 oh, years, yeah. Indigenous Australians have been looking up at our sky and our stars, interpreting. Um, the new members, my name's Mark Stevens, uh, I'm the current Vice President for the Society. Uh, only just started fairly recently and apparently I inherited Sky for the month as well off the previous Vice President. Uh, because there's no meeting in December, I've covered uh, the months of November and December. Okay, so highlights in November, which I, I do recognise is nearly half over. Uh, Venus and Jupiter are in place. So if it's clear out there tonight, if you go and look out towards the western sky, you will see Venus, Jupiter and Saturn all in a line. Um, the moon joins them uh, during the month. Uh, Jupiter and the moon are fairly close. Mars, Mercury and the moon are together. So you might say, well, how's this? No one's seen Mars. Well, basically it means if you want to see that, uh, Mars, Mercury and Moon together, you need to get up early in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because Mercury's just gone past its inferior mm -hmm. uh, conjunction. 
Uh, as Peter mentioned earlier, the Leonard's Meteor Peak was two days ago. So, uh, really ahead of the game here. But uh, the Leonard's do continue until the end of the month. So, uh, probably not in the same intensity, but uh, you still should be able to see them. And the full moon was on the 12th of uh, November. Uh, December. Venus passes close to M22 uh, globular cluster, so globular cluster in Sagittarius, uh, which is up there next to Scorpio, which at present is moving over towards the western sky. Venus and Saturn are fairly close together. The reason for that is that Venus has come around the Sun. It's now getting further away from the Sun, so it's rising in, in our evening sky quite high. It will actually effectively go past Jupiter and Saturn as they move towards a conjunction. Um, Venus is close to a crescent moon, not that that's necessarily a good thing. Uh, moon generally, if you want to look at the planets, the moon is, is not the best thing to have around. And uh, apparently around the 28th of the 11th is another meteor shower called the, I'll try and pronounce this, the Phoenicians, uh, which I reckon will be about 100 plus meteors an hour this year. So it uh, might be worth watching that one. And full moon, 12th of December. So the uh, November sky, uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, okay, cut and paste error there. It's actually the December sky. Uh, yeah. I thought it was probably quite the showing of the November one. So this is the December one. Uh, and this is looking uh, south. So effectively, sorry, that might um, And you notice uh, a couple of things um, of particular note. Oh, I can't see it there. Uh, Eta Carina and the Southern Plate is coming up uh, down the bottom here. You've also got uh, uh, a rather interesting globular cluster, 47 Canae of Carnae. And uh, for those, if you can't see Amiga Centauri, it's certainly one worth having a look at. Uh, it's over in the, in the Takana there. Um, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, looking north, it uh, still shows us that uh, Andromeda is, is still available to have a look at. Down the bottom uh, left hand corner there, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. If you really want to see it, you probably need to go somewhere uh, that gives you a fairly good view of the northern horizon. Uh, it's only just above it, and this is 11 pm, so there's a reasonable chance of seeing it. Uh, other features, uh, the Orion is now coming up, uh, moving into our sky uh, after uh, the winter absence as it normally goes through. Uh, so you've got M42, which is the Orion Nebula. And uh, there's a couple of other things marked here, M35. I'm not really sure what they are uh, at this stage. Uh, the Phoenicians, the uh, meteor shower I talked about, will come from uh, within the phoenix. Uh, you see the little star up top, thank you. Uh, and that's probably the area to look to to see the, that meteor shower. Uh, so what are the planets up to? Uh, Mercury reached its inferior conjunction on the 12th of November. Yeah, don't worry if you're not sure what that means, I'm going to go through that shortly. Uh, and so it now moves into the morning eastern sky. But apparently it's going to tend to hug the horizon, so it's not going to be really good uh, with morning twilight. Now the reason for that is as the, as the planet comes around the sun, it actually uh, sets after the sun. But as it moves to the other side, it sets before the sun. But that means it comes up in the morning before the sun, so that's why it goes to a, a morning object. Uh, Venus is pretty well placed for viewing. Uh, it's quite high in the, uh, in the sky of an evening and it's going to get higher. Uh, it doesn't reach maximum elongation until uh, the 25th of the 3rd, so it's going to be around for a few months yet. Uh, Earth, we reach the summer solstice on the 22nd of December and so the days uh, will be as long as they get. They start to shorten after that and the 24th of December, look for a bright red comet in the eastern sky as Santa heads off in his run. Uh, Mars, visible in the eastern morning sky. Is in Finland. You are? Sanchez, is in Finland. 
Yeah, but he actually hits down the timeline. Let us know when he's coming in. <coughs> well, I've just told him when he's coming. Now he's coming to people who've not been. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mars is visible in the eastern morning sky. It's, it's completed its conjunction with the sun. So it's actually uh, rising a little bit earlier now. So it's coming up into a dark sky. So for those who are really keen, want to see Mars, uh, you have to hop up nice and early to, uh, to see it. As for the others, Jupiter uh, is getting lower on the western horizon. It approaches its conjunction with the sun on the 28th of December. Uh, so basically, you won't be able to watch it after that. Uh, it will reappear uh, in the eastern morning sky uh, sometime after, or maybe a month or two after. So another one you'll have to get up in the morning to uh, watch until about uh, uh, June next year, I reckon. Saturn, uh, Saturn is sort of following Jupiter uh, in terms of it moves to its own conjunction in mid-January. Uh, it too, after that, will become a morning object. And Saturn and Venus pass within about two degrees of each other on the 10th and 11th of December. So uh, as, as Venus heads towards its maximum elongation, it will actually go past both Jupiter and Mars, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Uranus is still in Aries, which is, uh, will be until 2024, so no real hurry to have a look at that one, but Aries is in a fairly good position at the moment uh, for observing. Uranus, of course, is about seventh magnitude, so you'll need to scope to find it, but because it's in uh, a fairly reasonable um, uh, constellation, it, it might be a good one for newer members to have a bit of a crack at finding. And uh, if you want to know where it is, we have a copy of Astronomy 2020. Uh, for those who are 2019, there is a diagram in there which tells you where it is at any given time of the month. Uh, fair way off, it's only fairly small, so <coughs> you can really expect to see through an average size telescope probably the blue green disc. But quite a defined disc and uh, not too bad. Neptune uh, is found in Aquarius in the western evening sky. Uh, it sets at midnight mid month. So obviously up until then you can see it. I've looked at it through my telescope, it's only a blue dot. Uh, my telescope's the six inch, so if you really want to have a good look at it, buy a Hubble. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so how the planets look at the moment, uh, you can see Mercury is, is sort of in a gibbous phase, and that's because it's now heading around uh, through its inferior conjunction, it's heading around to the side of the sun. So, it, it only takes 22 days to go through 90 degrees of its orbit. So, quite a passable critter. Uh, Venus, on the other hand, it's still, if you imagine the sun there, Venus is still out uh, here, but it is catching the Earth because it actually orbits faster. It only takes 265 days to go around. At the moment, it's still got most of its face pointed to the sun, but by the time it gets to its maximum elongation, you'll see it as a, a, as a half disk. Uh, and crescent beyond that. Of course, it gets a bit bigger as it becomes a crescent because it gets closer. Uh, Mars, I'm not really sure what telescope they use for this, but uh, I've never seen Mars that big in my scope. Saturn, uh, still quite defined. It's on a tilt, so good viewing in terms of where its rings are at. Uh, Jupiter, always fairly spectacular, but uh, as I said, in a month or two's time, you're going to have to get up in the morning to see it. And Uranus and Neptune, Definitely not that size. And Pluto, there is actually a little black dot there. But Pluto at the moment is in Sagittarius, which is galactic centre. So good luck in picking which dot it is. The only real way you can probably do it is take a series of photographs over several nights, join them all together and see which one's the street. So now talking about uh, just a little bit for the newies. Um, <coughs> talking about orbital aspects. Now, what we have in the middle there is the sun. And <coughs> I'll borrow that, that point. I'll go back to the oh, yeah. <coughs> Who's got it? Oh. No, it's not good. Okay, so in the middle you have the sun, and this here represents the orbit of one of what's uh, the inner or inferior planets. They're called the inferior planets, it's obviously going to Mercury and Venus, are the two. 
and <coughs> both of them travelled uh, around much much faster. Uh, Mercury orbits the sun in 88 days, and uh, Venus orbits the sun in 247 Earth days, so uh, of course much quicker. When it's on the other side of the sun, where the Earth is, here's the Earth's orbit here, and the Earth's orbit is over the Earth's here. When they're over on this side, it's what's known as their superior conjunction. They're obviously in conjunction with the sun. They're the other side, you can't see them because they're behind it. Um, and because they're closer to the sun, they have two conjunctions. The other one being when they're between the sun and the earth, and that's known as its inferior conjunction. Now, the other thing I mentioned was elongation. The elongation is when it's at this point here that has the maximum angle between the sun and the planet. Best time to be observing it because it's as far away from the sun as it's going to get. Once it goes past its uh, elongation towards uh, its inferior conjunction, it'll, uh, it'll get lower in the sky. <coughs> Once it goes through that inferior conjunction, it becomes a warning object. And that's the <coughs> the sun. Now, with the outer planets, they only have one conjunction. And the reality is the Earth is moving faster than them, so Jupiter is moving towards conjunction. In actual fact, it's probably Earth is moving into here. So uh, Jupiter will be in conjunction. When they're on the other side, uh, so Earth is between the Sun and the planet, it's said to be in opposition. Okay, and I think last month I mentioned that Saturn went through uh, its western quadrature. Uh, sorry, it might have been its eastern quadrature. Uh, and that is when the angle between the Sun, and the Earth, and the planet is 90 degrees. And that is apparently meant to be a very good time to, uh, to view it. Any questions on that? Well, we. Except for yeah, but that's not looking at the. Your chart with the 15th of December, yep. there'll be six planets according to that. But how far does, when you, you ask for a long range weather forecast, because I'm really interested in the 15th of December. Why? Right? How far is that long, you know, how can, can you get a long range weather forecast? How long could it be? Yeah, how long could it, would it be a month? Could I get that? 15th of December. Yeah, well, but tomorrow. Where are you getting that from, Fred? Oh, you, you chart before, I'm looking 15th of December. Six planets are out on that day, right? The one before you put that up. With, with the planets on. There were six on the 15th of December. Out. That's right. basically what they were saying. It would look like Saturday, Neptune. And, and some of them would be during daylight too, so you wouldn't actually see them unless you had a telescope that you could find them. Okay, that's just the appearance of the planets at that time in the dark. That is for that diagram is that for any any Sorry? superior planet. Uh, that's not a particular planet there. That's no particular planet there. No, it's not representing it's a particular just, planet. It's, it's, Basically, yeah. uh, this one here is an outer planet's orbit. So for that, you can substitute Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, uh, and Mars. Okay? This one here represents an inner planet's orbit. So for that one, you can substitute <coughs> Mercury and Venus. This wasn't suggesting where the planets are at any given time. Yeah. What this is doing is showing you when you talk about conjunctions, yeah. oppositions, uh, quadrangers, and elongations. Mm. So where the planets are in their orbit for each of those uh, particular orbital aspects. Is that clear? That's fine, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, you might ask, given all the planets are on the uh, ecliptic plane, how come in the minor planets or the inner planets fly past the sun, we don't see a little dot go across the sun. And that's because the planets don't all operate on 
exactly on the plane. They all have a period where they're above it and a period where they're below it. And uh, to get a planet passing in front of the sun, one of the inferior planets passing in the sun, you've got to get it and the Earth on the same level uh, at the same time. And I just wanted an excuse to put up these slides. I'm not all that good, but this was taken by myself with a 60 mil refractor telescope, basically a little camera and a huge slice of good luck because I was just following it there. And uh, you can actually see, it looks better than that, not blown up. Um, but you can see that that was the scope there, that's the sun, and that was the planet Venus passing in front of it. The tragedy occurred on the 6th of June 2012. And for those that are keen, the next one's due 10th of December 2117. So, I don't think there'll be too many here tonight. It's actually going to hang around to see that one. So, that just gives you an idea of how rare it is for the two planets to align on a on a, a plane, a common plane. And we've been lucky the last 20, 30 years. We've seen a lot, three or four transits of Mercury. Now, it just so happens that where you are on the, on the surface of the Earth. But I remember when the last one happened. Uh, it was, look, the next one's going to be 2032, the next transit of the But there was one only, only a few weeks ago or something. There was one this year, a few weeks ago. Yeah. But yeah, not that's 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 Mercury being close to the sun has a few more transits than Venus. Venus is uh, about 0.67 astronomical units or about six sevenths, um, sorry, 67% of the distance from the sun that Earth is. Um, and so these are obviously quite rare. And uh, they know when they're going to happen, but uh, I'm tipping those who are predicting that uh, that next one aren't going to be there. And apparently what happens in convenience is they tend to happen in, in twos. You get two fairly close together, and then you better find a way of extending your life if you want to see the next one. Mercury. Mercury is a bit different. Yeah. Uh, probably because it's closer. Have the, they have that, because 13 rounds of Venus is equivalent to eight rounds of the Earth. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mercury goes around about four times in the same time we go around in one year. So it gives you a bit of an idea of how much quicker it is the closer in you are. Uh, other stuff, as I said, Pluto is in Sagittarius. Um, as I said, good luck with picking it out. So for those who want to try their hand at astrophotography, you'd need to take a picture of the sky in Sagittarius or over Sagittarius over a couple of nights. And scrutinise it and see which object moves. Comet uh, Pan Stars, who's lost from southern Australia as December progresses, uh, begins the month in Auriga, moving to Percy's, and uh, it seems to brighten to a tenth magnitude. I think the last time I did this it was about twelfth magnitude. Uh, it reaches perihelion for the new ones, that's its closest approach to the sun, before it starts to head off back out into the solar system. Uh, in May 2020, and it'll reach about seventh magnitude at that, uh, at that time. It should be viewable again in the southern sky just after perihelion. So, uh, diary for the month, um, I've just highlighted a couple of things. Um, some of the others, Jupiter 1.5 degrees north of Venus, probably not really going to interest someone unless you want to try and image both of them together. Um, obviously 1.5 degrees puts them fairly close to each other. Uh, now Mercury here in ascending node, the reason I've highlighted that is as I said, you've got your, your, your ecliptic plane and the planet's orbit at a slight angle to it. And when it goes through the ascending node, it's actually going up through the plane. So it's passing through the ecliptic on its way up above it. Um, and Mercury, Mercury of perihelion on the uh, 16th. 
basically means it's at its closest approach to the sun. So, I'm going to be really hard to see. A couple of the minor planets, Vesta and Ceres. Uh, locations for those, um, 0.7 degrees south of NGC 6553 uh, in Sagittarius. So, once again, looking at anything in Sagittarius, you, you're seeing a fair bit. Uh, that's in November. December, um, first uh, full moon is on the 12th, as I said, and moon is at perigee, and let's get at perigee, closest approach to Earth. So it should appear a little bit bigger, uh, not that you probably really think it. Uh, 2 p.m. on Saturday the 22nd is the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, after which uh, we start getting shorter again. And on the 28th there, you've got Jupiter in conjunction with the sun. So you won't be doing Jupiter at that time. Okay, information came from Astronomy 2019. Next month will be from 2020. Uh, there are still copies available for those who are interested. Very good source of information, uh, particularly for anything you want to uh, have a look at. And the 2019 Guide to the Night Sky by Dunlop and Tyrion. Any questions? Sky. Was that the dates out by one day right for this year or is it next year's? Uh, just one? this year. Well, yeah, this so year. I should have mentioned that. All the dates in the 2019 edition are one day out. So it was the 2020 yeah, so. Yeah. 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 yeah, it wouldn't have been noticed if Fred hadn't have noticed it. <laughs> Thanks, Discovery Houston. 20 seconds to LOS Tedris. 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 Discovery Houston. Nice to be in orbit. Thank you. LOS Tedris. Nice to be in orbit. As I look around the room here, if I were able to see, I would see to you if I were able to see, I would sing to you, do you see what I see? Because what I'm seeing here is a whole lot of my paw prints everywhere in the bookshelves. Greg, where are you? Greg organized us to do a lot of work during working bees a few years back uh, in the door, in the paint work, in the insulation, on the floor, and everywhere. That's what I see. But there are other things I see in this room that you might not see either. And that is a circle. I see a lot of opportunities here for us at Empaths. I can see a circle here. And whenever we talk about a circle, you see a pie, right? But not only a circle, I see a sphere. In fact, half a sphere. When we talk about spheres, we also see volumes. We can see pi, surface area. 
and I see half a sphere because I can see clearly a planetarium here. Think about when we have rainy nights and we can't see anything out there. What if we have a planetarium here? Next, please. And when we think about planetarium, we also think about how to construct one, so a ge geodesic. But that's related to buckyball. And if you don't get anything from my little talk, please look up buckyball. Buckyball, fantastic. Carbon 60. I don't know anything about it. Please ask someone who knows. <laughs> Chemistry is my worst subject. <laughs> but when I look up buckyball, I read pie bond, whatever that is. But there's another pie. Next, please. But not only in this room, out there on the ground, what if we have a, a planetarium? When we have chock block full of uh, people here in this room, and then more people want to come in because you know we are just so famous. We can set them in the, during a, a cloudy night in a planetarium that is collapsible, foldable, quick set up. But we can also think about all sorts of designs, like if you saw in Melbourne uh, last year, actually, for in May sometime, we had snow falling in Melbourne. And that was uh, made up snow uh, around uh, blow up Eskimo uh, igloo. They just use a you know, plastic thing, uh, round shape. So everything's about planetary, planetary. Next, please. Not only here in this room and out in, in uh, outside, but in the sky. Can you see what I see? You can see that you can hear that I can't see. But when we look out in the sky, we also see a lot of circles, orbits, everywhere, and circles, stars, the moon, everything. Even our eyeballs, looking at them, are actually spheres. So there's a lot of pie in here. That picture, I actually drew. I'm really proud of that. During a t the time that I was doing an astronomy course online. Next slide, please. A massive open online course. Uh, free at that time. And look at all these things we had to do as assignments. It's not really hard, actually. You don't need any complicated math. If you can do multiplication, division, uh, and uh, addition, subtraction, you can pass that course. But have a look at that. How many pies are there? I'll tell you now, if you do a course like that, hopefully you get a free one. The camera one, the AU one, is not free. Uh, don't use any calculators, use Excel sheets. Next, please. And more than just spheres and pictures, there are names, there are labels, there are concepts everywhere. That's pi. By the way, I read that in Greek. They don't say pi. Someone may be able to tell us, but apparently it's a plosive sound, like B. Okay? So, pi everywhere. And if I were able to sing, I would sing for you. With a pi pi here and a pi pi there. There's a pi, here's a pi, there's a pi everywhere. It's a pi pi. Next, please. This one made such an impact for me. Little Prince. He loved sunset so much. When he wanted to see sunset again, he just moved his chair for But we like to be here on the ground, especially after I've done that course, where it was it got complicated at the end because it went into astrophysics that you know their university students actually follow the same course. So even went into string theory as an option. 
But most people doing that course complain about, about week one, lesson one. It was just positional astronomy. It was about uh, longitude, latitude, about our angle, about positions of things in the sky and on earth. And people couldn't do it because people have been taught to use formulas. And then they were saying, what number do I put here and what? But I was trying to explain to them, it's very hard on online, you know, because you were using text and things like that. That when you are on the ground and you're familiar with looking at things in the sky, it's much easier. That lesson was really easy. Anyway, when we are here as well with the public and scout students, etc., I think it would be really great if we can connect with them about what they see in the sky compared to what they see on pieces of paper about orbits going this way, usually with the northern hemisphere. Anyway, when we look here, it's kind of different to a lot of people. So I need some volunteer volunteers here, please. Uh, three people, please. We need participation here. Oh, yes, fantastic. You don't have to do anything. <coughs> Just come and stand and hold something. Okay, yes, thank you so much. More, please. Two more, at least. Here is the sun. On the sun again? Yes. It's my job. Two more people, please. <laughs> When I come to, uh, from 10, I would like one more person. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Take off. No one. Sorry, yes, thank you so much. As long as I bring my coffee. Yes, yes. yes. Stand there holding your coffee. That's perfect. That's good prop. Now. Please allow me to just have fun. People who missed last month's talk, what I'm doing here are silly things, not really, but I would like to encourage people to take risks, to come out here and make some mistakes. We grow through making mistakes. We tell kids, oh, go out there and do that, but then we parents don't. So we would like more people to be used to being here and actually enjoy being here and make presentations and make announcements and make speeches. But first, you need to be comfortable here. And thank you for giving me moral support. But firstly, what do I do here? Sam, you also, could you also do something like this? Around you. This is the orbit, no? Oh, no, with the sun. <laughs> okay? Don't hit yourself. That way. <coughs> the other way? Okay. Thank you so much. Now I have for you not a whole time. This is Venus orbit. Okay, can you stand behind the sun, please? Don't hit each other. <laughs> and once you get the idea, you can stop being Mercury going around. And this is Venus going around, okay? All right, maybe you can stop now so that you don't hit each other. And Mercury is going around here, tilting a little bit over there. Why I'm doing this is because when I did this, this cry to people about the orbital plane, they don't see it, but this is like pitch visualizing what it is. <coughs> and now you are the Earth, right? Oh, that's very good. You are looking at this. So what you're looking, when Venus is going around, sometimes Venus going in front of the sun, and sometimes Venus going behind the sun, etc. But Peter can be Jupiter. He's an outlaw. Okay, can you see Jupiter? We are on Earth here. Jupiter is over there, and Jupiter's orbit is behind us over there. So sometimes we see Jupiter line up next to Venus, and other times Jupiter is over there. And then there's other planets as well. Thank you for being Jupiter. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope this is 
short one. Next slide, please. <laughs> I hope that we are having a little fun here, just being used to explaining concepts so that people listening to us can see what it means to have the orbital plane there and why we have ecliptics going around there and all the zodiacs behind all these planes. So thank you so much for your entertainment. I think that the sky tour is very important for us and navigation and constellation as well. So I hope you enjoy that little bit of fun. Thank you. Ian, do you want to give one, one trivia? Very short. Very short. Yes, I've been preparing uh, recently uh, my, my, my presentation for NASA next year, uh, which is going to be at Parks in, uh, in New South Wales. And uh, anyway, I, I found a book in my study which was all about Uranus. Uh, and I hadn't, didn't know much about Uranus, so I thought, well, I'll get on and read this book. And that's got me going, and that's, that's my subject, you see, to use Uranus. So I know a lot more about Uranus now than I did, but I still haven't finished. Um, and Uranus was discovered um, after all the other planets. The other planets were never discovered by anybody. Why not? There's no name associated with with the discovery of all the other major planets. Because all the ancients knew about them. Yes, they, they, were ancient, them. they were known in ancient times. We they just think they were identified. It's amazing how yeah? well, they didn't have telescopes, but they were, they were identified. And they knew that was Jupiter, that was Saturn, and that was, that was Mars. It's amazing how yeah? at the least there was enough educated people in the community to know these things. And that's how it got going. And then, of course, the, the idea of another planet. Um, nobody was seriously looking, I don't suppose. Not many, anyway. And then it was discovered in the 18th century. And who was, what year was it? 81. What? 1786. 1781, yeah. 1781, that was discovered. It was discovered by who? William Herschel. William Herschel. And what was he? Where did he come from? Germany. He came from Germany. Knew nothing much about astronomy but when he went there. He was a musician. But somebody put a telescope in front of him and, and explained to him what it was about. And he got to be interested. And away he went and became the world's greatest astronomer by just sheer hard work. And he dropped the musician bit. And the discovery of Uranus uh, wasn't just all he did. He discovered satellites of Uranus. How many satellites of Uranus did he discover in the next few years? Five. Hmm? Five. That's too many. He thought he actually had, that might have been the number that he thought he found, but he, a couple of them, he, 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 they were surface. They were not, he, he didn't, uh, didn't really, they weren't confirmed. So, but how many discovered, actually discovered, and it's on the record, is three. So there's three. And several have been found since. But I had that group. I remember I got involved in astronomy back in 1968, and there were 12 moons around Jupiter at the time, and 10 moons around Saturn. Everything was very manageable, right? And then they go and send up these spacecraft, go to uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 and because boy, well, you know where you are instead of 12 satellites around Jupiter there's, there's about 70 and the thing is they're not, you can't, how can you go and give them names and get everybody to think about these moons they, they go and looking for them uh, they can't be found but nevertheless they're there so they're going to be found and named by somebody or just given Catalog, catalog numbers. That's all. Anyway, that was what he what he did uh, at that time. And what happened then? But the thing is, the discovery of Uranus 
that led to the discovery of another planet the next century. Now, why was that? What was the evidence? <coughs> what was the evidence? That, how did the discovery of Uranus bring about the discovery of another planet? Discrepancies in the orbit of Uranus. Yes, that's what you call that. Starts with a P. Perturbation. Perturbations, perturbations, yes. They discovered, and it took two, two theoretical astronomers, one in England, one in France, to work on, work yeah. on it. And they actually worked out an orbit for a planet that was, in fact, being disturbed by, by Uranus and actually figured out where that planet would be at any one time. And the two of them, one sent his information to the observatories in, uh, in, uh, in Britain, and uh, which would have been Cambridge, I think, uh, or Greenwich. And uh, the other is a Frenchman, an older Frenchman. That fellow was a student, the one in England, Adams. The one in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Paris was a, was a, a scholarly, uh, aged astronomer, uh, but good enough to do the calculation. And he sent his information to the Paris Observatory. Now, neither of the observatories, the observatories didn't really take it seriously and look, look fine. So the one in Paris, he sent his to, he got exasperated, sent it to Berlin. And Berlin, they immediately jumped onto it, looked straight away and found, found Neptune. Uh, in the meantime, in England, uh, Airy was the, the uh, was the, uh, no, he wasn't, no, here he came later, no, but the, the Astronomer Royal in Eng England uh, wasn't that interested. And in any case, they just, they didn't find it, didn't look, didn't really see it. <coughs> so there it was. And the other thing I just talked the other day just came up, um, what, uh, uh, what uh, characteristics of the Earth or what property of the Earth have to protect it from the sun? In other words, to protect the people on the earth, or the animals on the earth, or the plants on the earth, or anything living thing on the earth, would be destroyed by the sun. If the earth didn't have a particular characteristic, what is that characteristic? Magnetic sphere. Hmm? Magnetic sphere. It has to have a magnetic field. The field, a reasonably solid magnetic field, which creates the ionosphere, which is around the earth which is uh, charged particles up there, a belt of that around, and that depletes the infrared, sorry, not infrared, ultraviolet, the ultraviolet rays from the sun. And the ultraviolet rays, if the full-on ultraviolet rays will kill every living thing on Earth, not just a bit of sunburn. Anyway, I haven't got time for any more. We haven't got time for any more. Yeah. That'll do. Yeah. Yeah. Right, for the final three videos, I'm mindful of the time, so I'll give you a choice. Um, we've got um, the interesting property of rotating bodies, which relates to the Earth uh, flipping magnetic fields. So that one goes for mm, probably about 12 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, Newton's cradle, I think, goes for about five or six minutes, and I think uh, the Rapunzel one goes for about um, three, three minutes, so it's a short one. Um, so can I have a show of hands to uh, first show uh, the rotating bodies one? Okay, uh, Newton's Cradle, one, okay, and Rapunzel. Okay, so it looks like we'll, we'll go for the uh, rotating bodies one first, then Rapunzel, then Newton's Cradle. And if, if people have to leave, then... Uh, I think it's good. Is that good? So just give me a second. Now you may have seen clips like this one before, but in this video I will provide the best intuitive explanation of how this effect works, or at least that's my goal. 
Now, it involves arguably the best mathematician alive, Soviet-era secrets, and the end of the world. So in 1985, cosmonaut Vladimir Janabekov was tasked with saving the Soviet space station Salyut 7, which had completely shut down. The mission was so dramatic that the Russians made a movie out of it in 2017. And after rescuing the space station, Janabekov unpacked supplies sent up from Earth, which were locked down with a wingnut. And as the wingnut spun off the bolt, he noticed something strange. The wingnut maintained its orientation for a short time, and then it flipped 180 degrees. And as he kept watching, it flipped back a few seconds later, and it continued flipping back and forth at regular intervals. This motion wasn't caused by forces or torques applied to the wingnut. There were none, and yet it kept flipping. It was a strange and counterintuitive phenomenon, one that the Russians kept secret for 10 years. Why the secrecy? Well, that is what we're going to find out. Six years later, in 1991, a paper was published in the Journal of Dynamics and Differential Equations called The Twisting Tennis Racket. And although it was related, it of course makes no mention of the secret Janabekov effect. The paper says if you hold a tennis racket facing you and then flip it in the air like this, it not only rotates the way you intend it to, it also makes a half turn around an axis that passes through its handle. So the side that was originally facing you will be facing away when you catch it. Now to understand this, we need to go through some basics. Like there are three ways to spin a tennis racket about its three principal axes. The first is about an axis that runs through the handle like this. The second is the way we were spinning it before with an axis that runs parallel to the head of the racket. And the third is about an axis that runs perpendicular to the head of the racket. Now it's easier to spin the racket around some of these axes than others. That is, you get more angular velocity for a given amount of torque. It's easiest to spin the racket around this first axis. It gets going really fast. And that is because the mass is distributed closer to this axis than to any of the others. We say its moment of inertia is the smallest when spinning in this orientation. The spinning about the third axis has the greatest moment of inertia and so the racket gets spinning pretty slowly. And that's because this mass is distributed as far from this axis as possible. So this is the maximum moment of inertia axis. Now what you'll notice with spins about these axes is that they're stable. There's no rotation happening about any of the other axes when you try to rotate around the first or third axes. But rotating about the second axis, the intermediate axis, where the moment of inertia is in between the other two, well, that is where you get this half twist. And there's virtually nothing you can do to stop it. And it's not just tennis rackets, of course. I've done this before with cell phones and with a disc with a hole in it. I took this disc on an ice rink and in a zero G plane, I have been obsessed with the intermediate axis bin. And what you need to make the intermediate axis effect work is an object that has three different moments of inertia about its three principal axes. And while that's not every object, uh, this object, for example, a spinning ring, has only two different moments of inertia for rotations like that, and then rotations wow, like this. <laughs> spinning things is not a special thing. Wow, I feel like it should be rotations like that. that that's, that's the one I was looking for. Anything with spherical symmetry has only one moment of inertia. So these objects will not demonstrate the tennis racket theorem. For that, you need what's called an asymmetric top, something with three different moments of inertia in its three different principal axes. Now the tennis racket paper claims the twisting phenomenon seems to be new. It is not mentioned in general texts on classical mechanics, amongst other sources that they've checked but it is actually it's even in the textbook they cited landau and lifshitz in fact an understanding of the intermediate axis theorem goes back at least another 150 years to a book called the new theory of rotating bodies by louis poinceau so this is old physics but in space the phenomenon looks like something new in microgravity the effects are just so much more striking than a half twist of a tennis racket. And at random intervals on social media, these videos crop up to frenzied questions of, 
Is this real? And what's going on? How does this work? Well, a number of simulations and animations have been made. But if you really want to understand what's happening, most people resort to the math, including me in the past. Well, the mathematics is kind of complicated, and boy, is there a lot of math. There's this story of a student who asked famous physicist Richard Feynman if there was any intuitive way of understanding intermediate axis theorem. And as the story goes, he thought about it carefully and deeply for 10 or 15 seconds, and then said, no. Well, the goal of this video is to prove Feynman wrong, to provide an intuitive explanation of the intermediate axis theorem. But the explanation is not mine. It actually comes from one of the greatest living mathematicians, Terry Tao. He has won the Fields Medal amongst a host of other awards. And for this video, I actually asked him for an interview, but he declined because he's busy solving centuries old math problems. So, you know, fair enough. But that's okay, because we have the explanation he posted to Math Overflow in 2011, and it goes like this. Imagine we have a thin, rigid, massless disk centered in our coordinate system. Now add some heavy point masses to opposite edges of the disk on the x-axis. Even though they're point masses, I'll put some large cubes around them to remind us of their significant mass. Then add some light point masses on opposite edges of the disk on the y-axis. Now this disk has three different moments of inertia about its three principal axes. Rotating around the x-axis has the smallest moment of inertia since only the light masses are moving. Rotating about the z-axis has the greatest moment of inertia since all four masses are going around. And rotating about the y-axis has the intermediate moment of inertia. Rotating like this, the only forces in the disk are centripetal forces which accelerate the big masses towards the center. This keeps them turning in uniform circular motion. Now what if we change reference frames so now we're rotating with the disk? Well then we see centrifugal forces appear. Normally I don't like talking about centrifugal forces because if you analyze things in inertial frames of reference, you never have to deal with them. But if you're in a rotating frame of reference, then centrifugal forces do appear in the analysis, pushing any masses away from the rotation axis. And those forces are proportional to their distance from the axis, in this case, the y-axis. So here, there is no centrifugal force on the small masses because they're located right on the y-axis. So the only centrifugal force acts on the big masses outwards, and that's balanced by the centripetal forces pushing inwards. Now this is all fine and good, but what if the disk is bumped so that it's no longer rotating perfectly about the y-axis? Well, now the small masses will experience some centrifugal force proportional to their distance from the y-axis. Tension forces within the disk ensure that the small masses remain orthogonal to the big masses. And since the big masses are still spinning in roughly the same positions as they were before with lots of inertia, they constrain the small masses to lie more or less in the yz plane. The little centrifugal forces on these small masses start accelerating them. And those forces get bigger as the masses move further and further from the y-axis. And they keep accelerating until they flip onto opposite sides. Now for the first half of this flip, the centrifugal forces are accelerating the small masses. But in the second half, the centrifugal forces slow the masses down, reversing all the previous acceleration so that they basically come to rest when they reach the opposite side. The pattern then repeats indefinitely with the disc flipping back and forth at regular intervals. And there you have it, an intuitive explanation for the intermediate axis theorem, or tennis racket theorem, or Janet Beck ball effect, or whatever you want to call it. So if this is well-established classical physics, why did the Soviets make it classified for 10 years? Well, possibly because of what Janabekov did after observing the strange behavior of the wingnut. He attached a ball of modeling clay or plasticine to it and tried spinning that. And sure enough, he found that just like the wingnut, this ball flipped over periodically. And the implication was that maybe since the Earth is a spinning ball in space, it too could flip over. I mean, we know the Earth's magnetic poles have reversed in the past, so could this be related? In 2012, with the Mayan prophecies of the end of the world, speculation about the Janabekov effect proved irresistible for some conspiracy theorists and people in the media. 
Plus, on May 13th, 2012, the official site of the Russian Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, posted an article in honor of Janabekov's 70th birthday. And in it, they said, the spinning nut of Janabekov caused astonishment and simultaneous danger to a certain part of the scientific world. A hypothesis was proposed that our planet, in the course of its orbital motion, can execute the same overturn. So how do we assess the validity of this hypothesis? I mean, is the Earth actually going to flip over? Well, we can get some clues from simple experiments performed by astronaut Don Pettit aboard the space station. He shows that a book will spin stably about its first or third axis, just as we'd expect, and a solid cylinder will also spin stably around its first or third axis. But a liquid-filled cylinder spinning about the first axis, that's the one with the smallest moment of inertia, it's unstable, and it'll end up rotating about its axis with the largest moment of inertia. Why is this? For an isolated object spinning in space, you'd probably think both its angular momentum and its kinetic energy would be constant. But that's only half true. Angular momentum stays constant, but kinetic energy can be converted into other forms of energy, like heat. So in this case, as the liquid sloshing around inside, the energy can be dissipated. And spinning about the axis with the smallest moment of inertia also means spinning with the greatest kinetic energy. And as this kinetic energy is dissipated, the cylinder has no other option but to spin about the axis that achieves the minimum kinetic energy. And that is the one with the largest moment of inertia. So when it's rotating end over end. For a given amount of angular momentum then, rotating with the maximum moment of inertia is the lowest energy state. So that is the state that all bodies will tend towards if they have any way of dissipating their energy. The US learned this the hard way with their first satellite, the Explorer 1. It was designed to spin about its long axis and be spin stabilized, but within hours of achieving orbit, it was rotating end over end. But what happened? I mean, it seems like a rigid cylinder. Well, the problem was these flexible antennas. They allowed the satellite to dissipate energy as they swung back and forth, gradually reducing the kinetic energy of the satellite until it had to rotate about the axis that maximized its moment of inertia. Now the Earth is just like this. It has ways of dissipating energy internally, so over time it has come to spin about the axis with maximum moment of inertia. And most astronomical objects do the same. Mars, for example, has a mass concentration or major positive gravity anomaly called the Tharsis Rise. And it is located not coincidentally at the equator because that puts it as far as possible from the axis of rotation and ensures that Mars is rotating with the maximum moment of inertia. Most asteroids, far from rotating about random axes, they spin, almost all of them, around the axis with the maximum moment of inertia. So the Earth won't flip. It's spinning about the axis with the maximum moment of inertia and that is stable. <clears throat> what you are looking at is pretty bizarre effect. I'm going to use some physics to answer the question of whether or not the Punzi really could support someone's weight just with her hair. So I'm going to make a few assumptions. The first is that it's possible to grow your hair to be 20 meters long. And that's a conservative estimate of what Rapunzel's length was. Hair usually takes um, one year to grow about 15 centimetres. So to grow 20 metres of hair would usually take 133 years. That's if everything else goes well. The current world record is about five and a half metres, and mine probably a measly 1.3 metres, something like that. But let's assume it's possible. Now Rapunzel's hair is going to weigh a lot. I found one estimate that 12 centimeters of hair would weigh 0.62 milligrams. That works out to be 103 milligrams for 20 meters of hair. Multiply that by 150,000 hairs on an average blonde head and we end up with 15 and a half kgs of hair. Now let's look at some forces. Downwards, we have the force of gravity acting on the hair. That's going to be 155 newtons. 
add the weight of say a prince and take his mass to be 80 kgs, that gives us a total downwards force of 955 newtons. Now there's actually no way that Rapunzel's neck would be able to withstand that kind of force. And in fact, one of the weakest components in this is going to be the bonds between her hair and her scalp and connecting to the skull. So the hair would actually probably get ripped out there if all of that force is going straight to the roots. However, that doesn't mean it's not possible to hold that weight. Rapunzel just needs to hook her hair or tie it around something to take that force directly off her neck and head. If she can do that, then lifting a prince shouldn't actually be a problem because in fact, human hair is incredibly strong. Each strand of it can hold about 100 grams. That's about one apple. So put together for 150,000 strands, human hair should be able to lift 15,000 kgs. That's incredible, and that's a casual 188 princes. I'm going to use some <laughs> physics to answer the question of whether or not. There we are, she could have had 188 princes. <laughs> and our last one. <laughs> okay, today I'm going to be putting a Newton's cradle in my vacuum chamber. So I've had a ton of requests to do this. I finally bought myself a Newton's cradle. I'm going to put it in the vacuum chamber and see how long it lasts when it's under vacuum versus when it's in air. But before I do that, I want to show you the Newton's cradle and how it works. And I want to explain something that you probably haven't been taught about the Newton's cradle. It cannot be explained how it works simply by using the law of conservation of momentum. Let me show you what I mean. So a typical Newton's cradle looks like this. It has five balls that are suspended on both sides by some strings. And they're suspended so that they're hanging directly in the middle of those strings. Now watch what happens when I lift one of these balls up and let it drop and hit the others. So you can see that when I give one ball some initial energy, it transfers that energy all the way to the end ball and the end ball pops off. And then that one swings up and comes back and hits the other one. And it just goes back and forth and back and forth. But now watch what happens when I let two of them go at the same time. So the middle one just kind of stays in the middle and now it knocks two off the other end and they come back and knock two off the other end. And you can continue that pattern and do three balls. And then even four balls. But here's the really interesting thing about Newton's cradle. You probably always had Newton's cradle explain to you that the reason how it works is through conservation of momentum. So when you lift one ball up and let it go, momentum is conserved so that when one incoming ball is going at a certain speed and it stops, then an outgoing ball has to continue in this direction in order to conserve momentum. But this actually does not explain how a Newton's cradle works at all. That's because, for example, momentum would still be conserved if I let a ball go and it hits here, and then instead of one flying off the end, two fly off the end, but at lower speed, at half the velocity. So if you're just teaching it through conservation of momentum, then there's nothing to say that when you release one ball and it hits, then two balls don't fly off the end with half the speed, or three balls come off the end with a third of the speed. But here's how a Newton's cradle really works. So you can think of a Newton's cradle as masses that are connected through tiny little springs. And the reason they have to be modeled like that is because actually when they hit, they elastically hit each other, meaning they compress just a tiny little bit. So basically it's like there's little tiny springs connecting them. And because these can be modeled as masses with little tiny springs in between them, that means that they have a specific frequency that they resonate at. Kind of like when you shake a slinky, it can only oscillate at specific frequencies. So when you release these first two balls and they collide, what happens at the point of collision is it sends a shock wave in both directions. And that shock wave is going to propagate the length of at least five balls. And so the shock wave that goes in this direction, it goes one, two, three, and it reflects off the end and comes back one, two, and it ends up right here. And then the shock wave that went this direction, it goes one, two, this direction, reflects off the end, it goes one, two, three, and then it ends up back here. So this is now the point of separation. So where the shock waves meet, that is now the direction that continues the momentum in that direction. So that's how the system knows where to separate. 
That's how it knows to only send two balls off of the end. It's due to the propagation of shock waves reflecting off the ends of the balls. So it, so it knows to only release two in this case, and it knows to release one in this case. Okay, so first we're gonna try this in air without the vacuum so we can see how long it lasts in air and then compare it to one in a vacuum with no air. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, it already stopped bumping back and forth. So now let's compare it to what it looks like in a vacuum. Okay, now let's vacuum out the chamber. Three, two, one. Okay, we're at full vacuum now. Let's close our valve, turn off the vacuum pump, and do our experiment. Three, two, one. So the first thing you'll notice, it's completely silent. So that looked very similar to the one in air. That's because a ball swinging through air at these low speeds actually has very little air friction already. And so air friction plays a minimal role in the reason why these balls stop. As I showed in a previous video of swinging a pendulum in my vacuum chamber, I showed that the majority of the stopping motion is simply due to the friction in the string. So the string itself is wiggling and turning, and all of that wiggling and turning is taking swinging motion away from it and turning it into heat. In this case, there's movement on the strings that gets turned into heat, and so these balls heat up slightly and they lose a lot of their energy to sound, and so eventually all of that initial energy that you put into it gets lost to entropy or gets lost to sound or heat in the room. Okay, today I'm going to be putting a Newton's cradle in my vacuum chamber. So I've had a ton of requests to do this. I finally... Okay. Probably. Sort of close it. Have you seen this one? <clears throat>